Good morning, everybody. Thank you out there in Metaverse for joining us today for a very special panel, A Voyage of Self-Discovery, Character Growth Through Myth and Mayhem. It's been an incredibly challenging six months, I know, for everyone, but we're so happy that you're here with us today to talk about a really fun topic and have a discussion with some experts in the field of coming of age, a topic that I'm sure we're all familiar with. We've grown up with coming of age stories, probably have our favorites, and we've certainly been exposed to it through different types of formats. Uh, and today we're going to focus on literary or on books. Uh, I'm Leonard Sampson. I'll be your moderator today. I'm a senior, marketer, senior author marketing manager with Amazon Publishing. I work with authors who write books for Amazon Publishing, and I focus primarily on our children's books, our young adult books, and our sci-fi and fantasy books that we publish through our 47 North imprint. Um, our uh, guests today, our special guests today, all also write for 47 North, and I'm very excited to introduce them to you. We have Luann G. Smith. We have Jeff Wheeler. And we have Charlie Ann Holmberg with us today. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Um, let's take a moment. I'd love to uh, give you a chance to introduce yourselves. Maybe we'll start with you, Charlie, and love to hear uh, a little bit about you, uh, maybe some few words on your background and how long you've been writing, uh, maybe share a current book you've read or been reading. And uh, of course, let us know if you have any projects you're working on. Um, okay. Hi, I'm Charlie Holmberg. I am a best-selling and internationally published author of fantasy and romance. I started writing when I was 13. I did a lot of fan fiction. And I, the last book I read that I really loved is uh, Where the Crawdads Sing. I think most people have heard of that one. Um, I really like that one. And right now I am working on a historical fiction that takes place in Rhode Island. Mm. Awesome. That sounds exciting. Writing since you were 13. <laughs> wow. That's it wasn't good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, you got to start. <laughs> That's impressive. Uh, uh, Jeff, how about you? Great. It's awesome to be here. Uh, my name is Jeff Wheeler. Uh, I started writing in high school and, you know, all of it garbage, but I'm really great for my career until I was able to finally leave about six years ago um, and become a full-time author and 47 North getting to, to be with you guys today. I write um, uh, basically epic fantasy. I've got many different series. Some of them kind of cross each other over. Maybe froze a little there, but... Uh... Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, sorry about that. We'll we'll go on to uh, Luann. Jeff makes more money than all of us, so it's oh, fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and my internet dropped. That's soon. Yeah. <laughs> I think we got most of that, Jeff. But I, but thank you, <laughs> thank you uh, for for sharing that. And uh, Luann, how about you? Um, hi, everyone. Um, I am probably the new kid here, even though I'm probably the oldest, but I just had my first series come out, The Vine Witch, uh, last October, and that Glamorous just came out in June, and then I've got one more coming out in the series, The Conjurer, and uh, I've probably been writing for 20 years, but it wow. took me until then to get published, so, <laughs> and other than that, I just, I'm working on a new series we just sold about um, a couple of witches in late Victorian London and they've got some kind of weird hangups and it's it's fun and I'm in research mode right now so I'm I'm mostly reading uh historical stuff because I write historical fiction and uh, I just finished a book called The Five about the Jack the Ripper victims and it was excellent it had nothing to do really with him it was all about the women and their lives and who they were and it was fascinating yeah Oh, that's very cool. I have seen that. I was actually interested in reading that too. Yeah, that's very cool. Well, thanks. Thanks all of you for introducing yourselves. It's wonderful to have you here. Um, I wanted to uh, uh, sort of set the table for us here for a voyage of self-discovery, character growth through myth and mayhem. Um, so what is today's discussion really all about? Well, I want to ask you whose own coming of age didn't feel epic as we experienced it ourselves and perhaps at least occasionally touched with magic. For thousands of years, literature has imagined and reimagined fantastical paths to maturity for heroes and villains alike. 
speaking of character growth and coming of age, I'd like to, I'd like to share something with everybody first, if I may, uh, that one of my favorite lines from uh, Star Wars, uh, the original Star Wars movie, A New Hope, and you maybe can tell I love love that uh, love that particular property um, has uh, one of the my favorite quotes from that original movie is you've taken your first step into a larger world that was Obi-Wan talking to Luke Skywalker and it was um, for me a signal that he was starting his own Luke's own a coming of age story it was kind of validating his path um, and that had had begun and at that moment he was going to be facing uh, from that point on a lot of change a lot of challenges he couldn't possibly imagine Myths and mayhem, uh, huge decisions to make, and ultimately uh, realizing his full potential. Um, I know, I know that that's not a book, but I think there was a novelization of the movie, at least, right? So, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> when it comes to books, um, some of my favorites uh, that always come to mind are like uh, around coming of age stories would be like Hill and Mockingbird, The Outsiders, The Hunger Games, yeah. the Harry Potter books, The Giver. Dune, etc. Um, and I know you three are no strangers to telling coming-of-age stories, so I'd love to dig into that now if we can. Um, so why don't we start off with, uh, uh, let's take turns, and, and I'd love to hear uh, what are some of your favorite coming-of-age stories? Are there two or three, maybe one, two or three, that really have resonated with you and have perhaps even affected your lives in a, in a big way? Um, Jeff, why don't we start with you? Sure. For me, one of my favorites that uh, when I was in elementary school was The Book of Three by Lloyd Alexander. And uh, I influenced a lot of different fantasy writers, too. In high school, it was Shannara by Terry Brooks. And I never thought I would recapture that again. But you're right. Harry Potter did that for me. Nice. Charlie, how about you? Um, you know, like you mentioned it, but a really big one for me is The Giver. Uh, I read that yes. one in junior high, and I think it was the first time I had to read an assigned book for English that I actually enjoyed. And it just like, <laughs> I remember the moment when the the apple flashes red, that like, that stuck with me so much. I don't know why. I really loved that. Yeah. Um, another more recent one that I've actually really liked was The Bear and the Nightingale by uh, Catherine Arden. Ooh. Um, like, that's, I don't know. No, like I don't usually write stories that that encapsulate encapsulate all the way from childhood to adulthood. But I really, really liked how she did that, and um, I think Amy Harmon did a really good job with the Last Girl Child as well. Nice, and more recent book there. That's awesome. Great, thank you. And and Luann, how about you? Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> one of the books I remember from childhood was uh, My Side of the Mountain, which. Mm -hmm pretty old um but it was about a kid who ran off to live on his own and he he lived in the hollow of a tree and um i remember he had to he eat crow and stuff anyways he, it was a survival story and it really affected me because my family were from colorado and we grew up backpacking in the summer and all the time so uh i really identified with that story and i ended up uh, getting a degree in environment and resource management i think because of that book i swear so yeah, oh, it had an influence, nice. and and uh, like you said, the Giver, brilliant book, love that book. Um, what's the other one? Uh, oh, to Kill a Mockingbird, of course. Yeah, that's yeah. that's a classic. And then a recent one I also really like um, is the Invention of Hugo Cabret. I don't know if you ah. guys have read that one. It's set in Paris, and I just adore that story. Adore it. Yeah, that's a great one. Oh, that's awesome. Yes. And I, I th that was the movie Hugo, too, wasn't it? Yeah. I think that became yeah. a movie and also. They did a good movie, too. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Very cool. Um, well, that, that is awesome. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I think the term coming of age is pretty familiar for most folks watching, um, for all of us. Uh, and, you know, we've experienced it a lot many times, been exposed to it in many different ways. Um, what, what are some classic elements to a really good coming of age story? Maybe Charlie, what do you think? I think I'll be first. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. I mean, I think like a big classic element, obviously, I mean, this is for all stories, but especially with the coming of age, I mean, you want to see like conflict and the overcoming of conflict, but you want to see conflict that's really specific to the character themselves. Because I mean, that's how we discover ourselves is what problems, because like something that would be a problem to me when I was a child wouldn't be a problem to Jeff, 
for example. And it's like, how do I overcome that? And how I overcome that kind of shapes the rest of my path, whether it's a small thing or a large thing. And, you know, maybe Jeff would overcome that in a really dark way and he becomes the bad guy of the story, but I overcame it in a good way. So I'm the protagonist, you know? So I really just think um, personal conflict and personal problem solving that builds character is a must have. Awesome. Great. For, for me, one yeah. of the elements of coming of age is the, the, influencer character like in star wars it's obi-wan uh this has been around for hundreds of years in the in the arthurian legends it was merlin and so in in many of my novels like in my mirrorwood books i have a character named medeiros who plays that merlin slash gandalf slash you know obi-wan role and i i think the character needs somebody to educate them about how the greater world or universe works and i think that's an element of coming of age stories that's been like I said, it's been around for a long, long time. Awesome. How about you, Luann? Yeah, I was going to say kind of the same thing. It's just, uh, I think there's that moment, a test of the character. And it's in that moment where they discover who, they're, who they are inside. And, and like she said, it, um, like Charlie said, you might go hero, you might go villain. And that's, it's just, it's gotta be one of those moments that really puts you to the test and it reveals who your inner character is. And uh, yeah. I think that's awesome. It's like the, that you each three hit very key uh, different points too, which which just is lovely. I think that um, the three of you should maybe write a book together. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but well, definitely have the... <laughs> oh, <there. laughs> Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> Thanks for volunteering for the villain. Although that is always my favorite part is the villain too. <laughs> awesome. Well, great. Um, taking a, a high altitude view, if you will, why, why, do, you, why do we think that um, coming of age stories are so popular and, and have they been a big influence on like the development of our, our society, our modern society? I mean, they're kind of like growing up for dummies books, but hidden really well, right? Mm -hmm. you know, think, that's interesting yeah i think especially like when you read them during your own coming of age they can kind of act as a sort of moral compass for you i mean i grew up when little house on the prairie was on the tv every single day right <laughs> and like that was like a huge part of, of my childhood and there's like so much moral stuff in there and so much you know how to overcome these like simple coming of age problems that definitely affected me and how you know, I perceive the world or how I, you know, solve my problems or deal with people, you know, so in a way, it's kind of like this literary roadmap that while sometimes things that happen in coming of, of age stories are larger than life or would never happen to you, you can still relate to them in some way or another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say the same kind of thing that um, there, there's a universality in coming of age stories. So no matter what setting they're in, if, you know, it's something that everybody can identify with, or hopefully you find a story that you identify with. And it doesn't matter if they're battling, you know, giant spiders or, or, or sword fights with orcs or whatever, but you understand that, that mission, or you understand that uh, coming of age of figuring out what your duty is or, or what you need to stand up for in life. Uh, and so that that's the universal thread, I think. And also, uh, just, you know, as a little bit older person, um, sometimes I go back and read those kind of stories, and you try and kind of figure out how your own life got to where it is now, too. And those stories help me do that in, in retrospect as well, not just for the young people, you know, growing up. <laughs> They're for everybody. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I couldn't agree more. That's, that's a well put. I love that. Jeff? You know, it's it's funny because I've got mostly teenagers right now in my household, and to see which books that they connect with, and one of the scariest ones that they all love is Unwind, the Unwind series by Neil Schusterman, and how the parents are the that villains uh, in, in this story. But it, it's interesting when you're a teenager, certain things do resonate with you, and I've I've enjoyed that series too, and it gives us something to talk about, like how horrific society would be and then we look at elements of our society today that might kind of echo some of those things so even 
a book like To Kill a Mockingbird, we can still see traces of, of those things today. And when something can resonate across generations and, and create those talking points, I think it's, it's very powerful reading. That is awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, Jeff, you mentioned teenagers. Are they watching this live now or are they going to watch it later? Um, I'm not famous in my own household, so <laughs> you'll probably never watch it. <laughs> I, I wondered because this is the first time I'm doing this and my two teenagers, well, one's a 21 year old. He's not, two, he's not a teenager, teenager anymore, but they're, yeah, they're, they're going to probably watch later. They were like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you. Thanks everybody. Uh, so what I'd love to do now is to move into talking about your own books, books that you've written and coming of age stories that you've developed. Um, uh, let's see, let's let's take turns here and go through, um, you, you choose any of your books, any of your series that you'd like. Uh, you've already mentioned a, a couple. Um, and then what was your, um, or talk us through your one of your characters. It doesn't have to be the main character, but that's, of course, a, a great option. Um, and their coming of age story. Uh, what was your inspiration for their story? Where did you start off with that? And then where did it end if it has indeed ended? I know some of your characters live on. Um, and, uh, you know, what was that motivation and, and did they succeed or fail? Uh, how about we start with you, Luann, and, and talk about the perhaps the Vine Witch or whatever you'd like to talk about. Yeah, and it's funny because um, before this panel, I, I, I wouldn't have thought of Elena going through a coming of age kind of transformation. And yet, thinking about it, <laughs> she starts with like the biggest transformation. She, she's a toad. And she has to metamorphose into a woman again. <laughs> and she's lost seven years of her life. So she she really was a different person before that. And then she's lost seven years. So she comes back into the story and all she wants is revenge. And so her art kind of takes her through learning if she's really the kind of person who is capable of that. And so she really has to face some questions in her life uh, that maybe she hadn't you know, before all this happened. But anyway, she um, also learned some very hard truths about her family at the end. So it, it really is kind of a coming of age story, even though she's like 27 in the novel. But, you know, she lost all that time. So it really does kind of work on that arc, I think, too. Yeah. I think that's really interesting, too, that a that, uh, great point that a coming of age story starts later in life. I mentioned Luke, and of course, like Luke's was, I don't know what, 18, 19 or something in that story, but 20, yeah, 27. I remember when you and I had a chance to talk back in October um, in New York that uh, you'd mentioned you wrote, and I, I'm sorry if I have this wrong, but did you, you say you wrote the first chapter? Like you just sat down, grabbed your laptop and wrote the first chapter in a couple hours or something? The first chapter, yeah. But that was before I knew she was going to be uh, a wine witch. So I wrote it. I wrote the first chapter in just, yeah, a few hours. And then it sat for maybe three years or more wow. before I finished that novel before I got the idea I needed to finish the novel, yeah. Amazing, that's awesome, so. sticking to it. <laughs> this, is, this is helpful, I think, for the audience, too, to understand what goes into these stories. Um, Jeff, so many books to choose from, <laughs> lots of series, um, lots of great, great stories that you've told. Um, please, it's hard to pick one, but what, wherever you'd like to start. <laughs> Well, first off, Luann, I, I love love the Vine Witch too, and I love that beginning where she literally tra is transforming back into a human again. I, I thought that was just brilliant. Um, for me, I want to talk about my Grave Kingdom series. The last book comes out next month, but you know, it was inspired by a trip I took to China. I was there for over a month, and so you know, I really felt like writing a Lord of the Rings epic set in China. But when I got back, I went out to lunch with my brother and sister-in-law and they were telling me about some of the, you know, the situations in their lives. And I have a, a niece who's a high school age teenager. And they explained to me that she has a form of synesthesia where she can smell people's emotions. And so just imagine for a second, it took me 30 seconds to realize oh my gosh, that'd be horrible to be a high school student and be able to smell people's emotions, especially in high school. And I just thought, oh my gosh, my main character has to have this ability. And how would that affect how I write the story? How would that affect her decisions? You know, if you have a coming of age story where you have the character who's supposed to be the chosen one, but she doesn't want to be the chosen one because she doesn't think the world is even worth saving because she knows what everybody's really like. And I just thought that ooh, that would just, that added in the, the timing of that, coming back from my trip, having that lunch, 
it, it just uh, created the character of Bing Mei, who is the, the coming of age heroine in the Great Kingdom series. And, you know, she's been tasked to save the world and she's probably going to die if she does. She doesn't want to, but I won't spoil it since the last book comes out in a couple of weeks. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, don't spoil it yet. That is wonderful. I, I love how these inspirations come from just about anywhere, and you never know what's going to spark that that thought or that story or that character. Um, uh, Charlie, let's spend a few minutes uh, uh, on your stories as well. Um, also, a lot to choose from here. Um, your more recent book, The Will in the Wilds, of course, your uh, Paper Magician series is someplace that, that, that uh, we'd love to hear about. Any, but whatever you'd like to talk about. Yeah, so um, when I was thinking about my own books, when like, I was looking at the topic of this, I was like, because I've never like sat down to think, I'm going to write specifically a coming of age. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it kind of sneaks in. Stuff that you know and stuff that you've done sneaks into your books. And I was thinking, which, which novel of mine might have the best coming of age story? And it's actually, I think, The Fifth Doll. So that's a standalone novel that I have that is about um, essentially a woman who's trapped inside a magical nesting doll. And um, she, it's really interesting because she like, you know, she's also an older character. She's 26 years old, but she's treated like she's a child. And it's um, a Russian based story. And, you know, in this time period, you often weren't seen as an adult until you were married and she's betrothed to a man. So she's finally like, I'm going to marry this guy. Like she doesn't love him, but she's excited anyway. I'm finally going to be an adult. Her parents don't treat her very kindly for reasons. <laughs> and, you know, and so like, she's a grown woman who's treated as a child. And so it was fun. Like some of the things I was able to do with her. And I think is a big part of coming of age is, um, Discovering yourself through your own unblemished perceptions versus discovering yourself the way the world sees you. Mm -hmm. And something that's just so remarkable about kids, you always say that kids are so honest. It's like, just because they haven't learned not to be, right? Kids can see themselves as Superman. They can see themselves as so many things because they haven't been told no by society. You know, it's not until like my niece started watching a bunch of Disney movies that she decided she was fat for example. You know, it's, it's this perception that's forced onto you. And so that was something I, that was interesting to play with. It's like, because of uh, abilities that, that she gains in the story, she sees herself one way at the beginning, and then she's forced to hear what other people think of her. But then she's also forced to hear what her own dark subconscious thinks of her. And she has to discover who she wants to be and who her true self is and find a way to push those other things aside. And once she does that, she's basically faced with these enormous life shattering choices that will affect not only herself, but the people around her and will completely divert her life for the rest of time. And, but now that she knows herself, she's able to make those choices. Nice. Do you find yourself, um, oh, sorry, were you about to say something? No. <laughs> oh, I, I looked down for a second and I heard, um, um, do you find yourself uh, going back to your own experiences when you're developing these characters? Uh, is that a regular thing or do you, do you um, not necessarily do that? I don't know if you can write without going back to your own experiences, right? Because you, you'll have a character that maybe is in a situation, like I'll have a character who maybe is in a situation that I haven't been in before, but I have felt those very similar emotions in a situation I've been on, and that's what you draw from. I mean, when they say write what you know, they don't just mean, oh, you can only write about a Western Mormon woman who's super boring, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's like, you can write what you know. It's like, well, I know what it feels like to be betrayed. I know what it feels like to be hurt. I know what it feels like to be happy, you know? And and little experiences that you have and and emotions that you have always, they they have to come out in your writing. I don't I don't know how you could not have those things come out in your writing. Right. What are your thoughts, Luann, on that? Well, the thing is, the good guys and the bad guys are all us. We're all of our characters. It all comes out of us, you know. <laughs> and and sometimes you don't even know that's in there until you start writing. And so, yeah, you just rely on yourself, what you know, what you feel, how you react to things around you. And like she said, it's just what you feel. You understand 
those universal emotions and you try and bring those into the book as much as you can and as much of you as you can sometimes. I mean, I also don't like the thing where people say, oh, you are your character. And I'm like, well, <laughs> I am, but I'm not, not her. <laughs> Just parts of her are, are me. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. How about you, Jeff? Would you? Yeah. Yeah. Just like the the other said, we of course we all draw from from ourselves, and I've had readers say like, "How can you write about teenage girls, Jeff? I don't understand." But <laughs> I have nieces, I have daughters. You know, I have. Yeah. I, I, you know, we we get our inspirations from lots of places, and I know my own children now have have influenced my writing and some of the characters. And I, I recently had a conversation with my twenty one year old daughter, who felt like you know, she got to know me better through my books, but she also felt that I was setting this unbelievably high standard in the books. And I'm like, no, I'm not trying to set a standard for you. That's just a character, actually. It's not, you know, when I was 21, I did not act that way myself. So it, it is interesting as I've, as I've gotten older and as my kids are reading my books now, the, the questions that come up and the influences that they want to know how how that works together but at the end of the day it's still a book we, we borrow things um we, we may make those pieces happen together but it's, it's part of the fun process that's interesting have, have uh, either of uh, charlie or luann have either of you had a uh, friend family member sibling say hey i think that character is based on me <laughs> not yet <laughs> yeah i haven't really had that yet no no I, it's interesting Jeff, but it doesn't but, mean uh, it's not uh, true oh, <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting, Jeff, too. That, that, you know, uh, I really like what Luann said. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, go right ahead, please. I really liked what Luann said because it's like, because like part of us is in every character, including the bad guys. The bad guys. Right? Because I mean, all of us are going to smell bad at some point. <laughs> right, Jeff? <laughs> <laughs> like, like, how many times have we wanted to get revenge or we wanted to like hurt somebody, you know, and, and we have those things come out in our stories. But like, I feel like, writing a story where you, you control the good and you control the evil, I feel like you can develop almost a sort of emotional intelligence from being able to do those things. But then there's also the satisfaction where you can do in a book what you can't do in real life, and that's control, right? You have control. You can make the happy ending happen. You can have that really smart comeback to the punk kid who's taught, you know, that you think of two hours after after the incident but you can have it right then and it's just this amazing thing and tangent it just makes me think of like the first time I ever played Dungeons and Dragons because I'm a writer and I'm used to being able to control the story but in Dungeons and Dragons I can only control one character and I'm like no it'd be so cool if this happened and then someone else's character does this thing and I'm like ah! <laughs> it would make me go crazy and I had to learn that it wasn't like writing a book <laughs> but you know I really think that there is a lot of self-discovery when you're writing a book. You can almost say, if you want to bring this back around, that you kind of have a coming of age of your own every time you write a story. <laughs> I love that. I love it. Ooh, our, Charlie. Our, <laughs> yeah. That was going deep there. I mean, right. Aren't we all kind of writing our own? <laughs> We're still coming of age. I don't know if it ever, if that ever ends for us anyway. Sure. Um, that's awesome. I, I, I love that. You made a couple of points there, too, that make me um, want to ask you um, each. Are there... Uh, what what are some of the struggles you've had in developing these characters? What are some things that are just road bump, bumps you've had, or or even if you want to talk about maybe a failure in a character that you really wish you could go back and change right again? Everyone wants to talk about failures, um, <laughs> but but it's a really good question because as as I've looked back at my own life, it's some of my own personal failures that have influenced me. The most and I, I took a risk in my harbinger series because you know my my characters always make the right decisions or they try to and really hard things happen to them but they tend to overcome those things and and one of my characters in the harbinger series she went off the rails she made the wrong choice and 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 did that and i had a lot of readers frustrated like no that she wouldn't do that but it's like well if you look what happened in the other books it, they, those things built in and that happens in real life that our own lives tragedies strike things happen and knock us off the rails and i think it's important to not get too formulaic 
in our writing that it's like, okay, this happens and this happens and this happens and it all resolves. History doesn't work that way. Life doesn't work that way. And I, I like blending some of that reality, those hard things, and sometimes those bad choices because it's those choices that often influence and change us long-term and, and, and make us who we are. So my own failures in life, uh, you know, there, there are plenty, but they've all informed who I am today. I'm on book two of that series, and so I'm now like, who is it? <laughs> who goes off the rails? <laughs> Not gonna say. I think I know. Who it is. <laughs> so how about you or uh, you, Luann? Uh, no, he he said it pretty good there. Um, yes. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know. <laughs> no, going back yeah. to kind of the first question that you asked, you know, like what do you need in a coming of age story? Like one of the characters that I definitely struggled with was um, Sandis from uh, my Numina series, mostly in the third book. In the third book, I was like two thirds of the way through the book and just her scenes were just dragging and I could not figure out why I just didn't want to write her, her scenes. Like all of a sudden I just didn't want to write this book and so much cool stuff got to happen in that book. And I, and I realized that by book three, like she no longer had to have those personal struggles. Like she, she had overcome all these big things and she never, she, she didn't have growth anymore. Like she had stopped growing as a character. And I was like, oh, well, it's like nobody wants to read about that. And it's like, she, she's just deadlined, you know? And so that was something I had to actually go back through. I had to figure out what, how do I make this character grow? And I had to go back through and, and fix everything to make it work. But that's probably one of the characters that I struggled with the most was Sandus in Siege and Sacrifice. Mm. Awesome. Uh, flipping the, the, oh, were you about to say something? Sorry. I saw a mouth open. No. <laughs> no one's mouth. Um, <laughs> mouth closed. All closed. Everyone's mouth closed. I'll know the signal. Um, uh, flipping that the script a little bit here on this, um, what, what are, can you tell us about a time when you really nailed it? When you, maybe it's bringing to bear all of the experience that you'd had up to that point, but, um, and, and, you know, Luann, maybe it's, it's, it's Elena, but, you know, where you just got that character right. You knew this is this was the right way to tell the story. Hey, hmm. it, well, Elena, yeah, I think she turned out how I wanted her to be. But the the other character, are we okay with spoilers? I mean, everybody doesn't care, I guess. But uh, <laughs> Gerda is my villain in the in the book, and she surprised. She came out pretty good I thought um because she she's she's the coming of age story that went really wrong yeah she really went that way when she should have gone the other way and it well what do I want to say about her <laughs> she um metaphor just made the perfect kind of villain for that book for that story because it touches on a lot of stuff because she's from 300 years earlier obviously she's she's been around a while she's seen the world so yeah. she's very very i mean she's adult as you can be she's been 300 years old but she's she's also in the body of like an 18 year old <laughs> and still wants to be that person so she's just a mess when it comes to that coming of age growth she just did not do it but it, she made a good villain for my for my good character who does so yeah that that she felt right to me yeah, I don't think that was a spoiler. I think that's an enticing way to get people to read that book. It's, it's. I love the, um, the, uh, the spoiler parts too of the of um, story. Sorry, it was, it was something else. Awesome. Well, um, oh, or Charlie or Jeff. Sorry, I didn't give you a chance to answer that. Um. So, the frag, this one's easy. <laughs> um, a character that I nailed. Let me tell you, mm -hmm. um, Aldi from the Plastic <laughs> Magician. So when I was originally planning out that story, I was like, okay, we'll do this, we'll do this. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm writing Sandy again. It's like, Alvy can't be like the protagonist from the you know, original trilogy. She needs to be different. And I couldn't figure out how to make her different till one in the shower where all the good ideas happen. I was like, oh, I should just make her super awkward. <laughs> like, I should just make her the most awkward. And I did, and it fit so incredibly well that she still to date is my favorite protagonist I have ever written it's so fun to write her 
-hmm. Like, honestly, like who isn't awkward, you know, but (laughs) I feel like I just had so much, I like when you have fun writing something, when you enjoy doing something, other people are going to enjoy it too. So hopefully other people enjoy her because the, the funny thing about it though, is people will say like, oh yeah, she's so much like you. And I'm like, oh gosh, like I perfectly made this person awkward. And apparently she's the character who's the most like me. (laughs) (laughs) I'm, I've always been very proud of her. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I, I love I love Alvi too, Charlie. And now that I know that it's you, it, yeah, it totally makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. Great character. You know, I've um sometimes for me the characters become so real, like they're they're their own people. And I've heard, heard other authors say this. And so to me, I know when I'm getting it right when they do something that I don't want them to do. Like as the author, I'm like, no, you need to do this. And as the character, they're like, no, and I'm doing this. And when they become that real to me that they are making their own decisions inside my head and on the page, it's like something magical has happened. And I I, I love that experience. And that's happened several times where they, they know what they want to do and and they just go with it. So yeah, they, they almost become like real people to us. Well, can I tell you that that was the situation with one of my secondary characters in the vine, which um, Yvette, she was only supposed to be in one scene in that book, but she just said, no, no, I got lots more to do. And she just, she ended up getting her own book. So yeah, they, sometimes they just take over cause they're just meant to be, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Taking a life of their own. Yeah. That's awesome. Oh, thank you. Thanks for sharing your thoughts around this. This is so great. I, I, I wanted to take, we're, we're what about, eight and a half minutes left. I wanted to shift a little bit and talk kind of the, the future, if you will, of coming of age stories. Um, you know, obviously to say the least, it's been a pretty tough past six months for, for just about everybody globally. Um, we've taken, uh, we've been through a lot. We've taken a long look at ourselves and, and our society and the way we think of things. Do you think that the events of 2020 so far and who knows what's to come um, are going to cause some sizable shifts in coming of age stories? Do you think there's some things that you might predict change maybe for your own writing how about you charlie um well the thing with coming of age stories so like they kind of reflect every generation and every generation's coming of age is different from those that preceded it because the world changes i don't know if you guys have seen that like seinfeld netflix special where he talks about like oh we were running around like wild animals (laughs) you know whereas now it's like helicopter parents and and all that stuff because everyone's everyone's <laughs> childhood is just so different and like my kids so my kids are still pretty young and and this is the COVID and the pandemic and everything is definitely going to affect their childhood so much differently than mine was and even before that happened it's like they are just like surrounded by technology and I wasn't when I was when I was growing up and so and yeah like who knows how long these things are going to end up happening. But even if they end at the end of the year, I mean, that's like a whole year of just this strange thing that's going to flavor their coming of age for the, for the rest of everything, you know? So any like real world setting stories that we're going to do, like we have to consider those kind of things, but then it also is almost like inspirational because there's, there's certain tropes and everything that, that, in, are entailed with coming of age stories and having something so strange like this happen that changes the world maybe will help us think outside the box and it's like well and maybe if I'm writing an other world fantasy or a futuristic story or whatever it's like what strange thing can I do to kind of break the mold of a coming of age story to show a different way of learning and growing and finding a different truth for these characters and what we've seen in the past yes. Awesome. Yeah. I've got a thought. Um, You know, something about this, what I I hope doesn't happen is we have usher in a generation of pandemic stories. You know, that's, you know, that's something I hope doesn't happen. But um, I'm currently working with a studio to uh, produce one of my series as a a TV series. And something I've been learning through this process that they've been talking about is, what the pandemic has done, what COVID has done, is it's, it's shown that there's not a lot of things that families can watch together, that everyone's on their own screen, and they've already watched everything now, and 
there's stuff that, well, I don't want my kids watching Game of Thrones or I don't want, so, you know, or some of my parents aren't going to be interested in rewatching Avatar for the 50th time or <laughs> we, yeah. we, the, the, there needs to be content. And it's made me think about growing up. Like I know Charlie and I both watched Star Trek when we were young. I used to watch Battlestar Galactica, the original, uh, Buck Rogers, you know, lots of science fiction, a lot of things like that. We watched it together as a family and now there's not a lot that we can watch together as a family. And what I'm hearing is a lot of the studios are looking for, we need more coming of age stories that will bring multi-generational families together. The grandparents will wanna watch it with their grandkids, the parents and their teens, everyone together. And I hope that we see more of that. And I'm excited to be able to, to lend to that with one of my own, my own series. Amen, awesome. hallelujah. Yeah, yep, <laughs> totally agree. I think we all that applies to all of us, right? On our, our lives as well, very well. Yeah, it's interesting because I grew up in that age where there was just like four channels, and you did. You all sat around the TV and watched together on Sunday night or whatever. Yeah, I remember like, those days, Luann. <laughs> hmm? I remember those days as well. <laughs> and everybody sat around like watched Roots or the big mini series that came on, so everybody yeah. was kind of on the same page. But boy, after this year. Though the crazy year we've had it seems like anything goes. I mean, you always say, oh, that wouldn't pass in fiction, but what's happening in reality? So who knows what's going to come out for stories? You can't ever say that couldn't happen again. So, oh, yeah, great point. Great point. Thanks, all. <laughs> uh, one last round of uh, questions. Let's, 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 uh, let's call it a, a lightning round, if you will, uh, for our aspiring authors who might be watching today or down the road um, to watch the recording. Uh, what's one piece of advice that you'd give them? Jeff, let's start with you. Um, one of the things I love to do is I like reading biographies of some of my favorite authors and just to learn about their stories and how they came oh. about. Uh, yeah. one, of, one of the authors that's influenced me is Frances Hodgson Burnett, who did Secret Garden and The Princess. And so I've been, I read her biography, and she talked about how when she was living uh, in Manchester, England, she would look over the wall to kind of the poorer side of town and found like coal workers and stuff. And she actually wrote a, a novella about one of those, because she just imagined a story related to one of her neighbors who didn't even know she existed and she didn't even know the girl's name. And so I read that story just with that in context. And my advice for, for writers is you need to watch the world, pay attention to your neighbors, pay attention, observe. And because you never know when an idea might come to you that, that might get turned into a story someday. Yes. Blue Ann? Um, well, like we were talking about earlier, how I kind of waited three years for the right uh, angle for the Vine Witch. And part of that is, I think it's really important to, you know, go through ideas. The first ideas aren't, everybody's got those. You gotta go deeper. You gotta go with um, the concept, if you can. Think about concept, but get that idea that's gonna be uh, yours and yours alone and make it yours. It's gotta be unique to stand out in the market today, you know? Everybody's writing a book about witches, so you've got to find your angle in there and what that's going to be to stand out. And it takes a while. It took me three years to figure that story, <laughs> what it was going to be about. Yeah, but be open to uh, inspiration because that's where you get it from, just things going on and paying attention and being involved, and Great. it'll strike you someday. Great advice. Charlie? Okay, so I generally give the same advice every time I'm asked this question because it's kind of, it's the advice that got me going. So it's a two-parter. And I think honestly, the most important one is to let yourself suck. Okay. Uh, so many people don't get, don't get books finished because they're so busy editing what they already have and editing and editing and over editing and over and like, so you just have to let yourself be bad. Every is bad. You have to just accept it. You have to murder the internal editor that's in your head. <laughs> and then the other thing that I tell people is to do a daily word count because honestly, the number one reason that you know aspiring authors don't ever get published is because they don't ever finish a book. And you can't publish a book if it's not done. So if you even write just like 500 words a day, depending on the spacing, that's about half page to a full page on my <laughs> Okay, it's not, it's not that much. But if you yeah. do that, you can write a novel in six months. That's two books a year. Pace. And if you just let yourself be terrible at it, 
then you're going to become good at it. If that's so, those are always the two things I tell people. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you, thank you all. We are just about out of time, so I want to thank you for a wonderful discussion. That was awesome. Um, really great to see all of you. I'd like to thank our authors, Luann G. Smith, Jeff Wheeler, Charlie Ann Holmberg. I'd like to thank uh, Repop and Metaverse, the Metaverse team, for making this panel possible and this weekend possible. And I'd especially like to thank the viewers who were able to join us today and those of you who may watch down the road in the coming months or years, uh, watch the recording. Um, please all take care of yourselves, your family and your friends. Stay safe and healthy. And thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Leonard. Take care, everybody. My pleasure. Bye.